Yeah, really interesting. And uh, yes, I've got the signal that we have to move right along to our next speaker, our fourth speaker for today. So let us check if Miss Jo Haverman is here and see if we can beam her into our virtual screen real quick. I said we need an extra minute. Um, she's with Access to Perspectives, which is a scholarly training and consulting organization providing novel insights into the globally inclusive management and communication of research based on open science principles and standards. I'll check with our team if we still need an extra moment. She's coming, good. I hear the she's coming signal, so we'll wait a moment and see if we can welcome Joe Haberman. And there, I have the thumbs up. There we are. Hello, Joe, ha Joe Haberman. How are you? Hi, very well. Good. How are you? Very good, thank you. Where, where are you coming from right now? Where are you located? I'm, well, I'm based in Germany, but currently calling in from Malawi. Oh, okay. Oh, well, greetings to Malawi then. <laughs> we just mentioned before by Luis. Good. Then I'm going to quickly introduce you, and it looks like you have a very good connection, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, and then we can begin with your keynote. So, Joe Haverman is an independent consultant and trainer for open science communication and global research equity with a background in evolution and development biology. Her work experience covers NGOs, a science and international institutions, including the UN Environmental Program. With a focus on digital tools for science and her label, Access to Perspectives, she aims at strengthening global science communication in general, with a regional focus on Europe and Africa through open science. Her talk today will be titled, Barriers and Enables of Global Research Equity. So with that, it is my great pleasure to give our digital stage to Ms. Jo Haberman. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, um, it's a huge topic, as you might imagine. Uh, imagine many of you are well aware of that. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can live up to the expectation <laughs> that I also in part put up myself. I'm very glad that I have the opportunity to speak back to back with Louise, because as she also mentioned, we work closely together. Um, we have published an, um, a study together, that which, which I will sh show you a little bit more of. But um, starting with, I would like to um, show you this image, which some of you might come across, where we um, differentiate or learn to understand the differences between equality, equity, and reality. And um, while this is quite informative and enlightening to look at and understand that there actually are differences, especially between equality and equity, and then looking at the realities of things in the world we find ourselves in. But um, there was a comment on LinkedIn to this infograph um, by Asha Abdila, who, who thought, and I also had issues with this image, like it's, it's not the people who are, who are, I mean, different, yes, we are all different, but and yet the same, but there's something wrong with the boxes. And yes, either the number of the boxes or the shape of the boxes. So. Um, then I thought, okay, how can we translate this now into the um, academic system? So here you see the boxes, and I've colored the boxes based on research capacity, access to funding, prestige and privilege, and open science practices. So some boxes, but well, these are all boxes which are components of the scholarly ecosystem. And here we have reality, equality, equity, and justice. Um, the previous image sometimes also includes justice as a component, and this is what we are working towards. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, we we want to provide equitable access and, and equitable research opportunities. Okay, so now um, what are what what are the realities that we now look in? Of course, the boxes are not equal in size and shape. We have differences, and then each of the um, columns, so to say, you have always three. The first one refers to resource rich um, um, research environments, then medium size and low size. And you see when we um, adjust the boxes to the actual size based on access to funding, um, prestige, and, prestige and privilege, and research capacity, or adoption and implementation of open science practices, practices we have harsh differences in, in size. And now if we let the drops just drop down, um, and draw a dash line, um, and the dash line now um, draws the line between research effectiveness, what I call. So yes, um, there's research being conducted all around the world, but to what extent can it unfold its effect? 
to society is why why do we do research in the first place and what are the means available to researchers to produce research results that then can also unfold their um the, yeah, their wisdom and, and help society and help save this planet or um, act on a local level um so yeah so that basically shows you that the mid-sized um it's it's worth thinking this through in all details um, and the medium size um, um, research capacity institutions and regions in the world they're already struggling to have an impact um, and there's many other reasons like um, we have an overabundance of um, research article production like who's who's reading a research article nowadays anymore and to, to, to what extent can we actually make sense of it based on the accessibility and availability of the underlying data sets? But these are all questions um, that are also part of this conference, obviously, bounced um, back and forth and obviously also um, ground for many of our activities. But yeah, now coming to the capacity and the opportunities to do research in the first place. Um, some of you might come across the academic wheel of privilege, which was developed by the team at Ford, Flavio and his colleagues. Um, and yeah, we can also spend an hour here to go into all details, but it's it's important to look at this in the sense of being aware that there's different forms of privilege and many are given, some are achieved um, through opportunity seeking and um, making use of opportunities that, that present themselves. But most of these we don't actually have control about. And people are judged by the color of their skin, by the way they speak. Language barriers can be a limiting or are often a limiting factors um, as an ac academic world. Um, so this wheel of privilege exists in all kinds of contexts and is now was adapted to the academic context. Um, also, like to, to I mean, this is all quite meta so far, but please bear with me. We have the Hum Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and you might or might not be aware of that Article 27 actually says that everyone, every human being on this planet has the right to freely participate and share in scientific advancements and its benefits. And this now calls upon um, yes, the opportunity to participate as a researcher from anywhere in the world, but also as a citizen to engage in, in research and to um, benefit from the research results. So there's different um, dimensions to it, some of which also speak to global research equity. And we have the fair and the care principles. Um, to what extent I need to introduce those, uh, especially the care principles um, at this point at this conference and to this audience. <laughs> Um, but I also want to point out the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I, when it, when I my trainings as a consultant or trainer for for open science practices or research uh, management generally talk about the fair principles, I always call mention or or mention along the care principles. They were developed by indigenous indigenous representatives, but they're very well um, applicable also to any research field and any any. Um, yeah, because we not only need the technical requirements to make research data and research content also as a manuscript um, accessible and searchable and reusable, but we also need to, to have ethical standards and, and workflows and authority, collective benefit, all of that in place. Um, and that's the responsibility and accountability that researchers need to or often also do embrace on. It's just not um, often easy to, to implement that um, in a straightforward manner. There's also the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which explicitly says that Indigenous communities and many researchers across different disciplines engage with um, traditional and Indigenous communities, um, how they should be engaged with. It was defined by their representatives um, over decades of work in, in coming up with this um, this paper and recommendation and there's several guidelines and principles and, and policies on a local level, national level and international level and what good um, engagements um, look like. So, yeah, so what does it now mean, global equity and scholarly communication? Um, so, um, so chaos is a place where you can define and, and also get into your eye for a scientific definition, which I've and I've tried to, to boil it down to 
global equity in science and research um, is the opportunity for opportunity for researchers from around the world to be able to consume and share research output based on open science, fair and care principles. Since research capacity varies, as we've seen, and as we all know, drastically within and across world regions, local conditions such as available funding, research infrastructure, internet connectivity should not interfere with the potential of academic success. Um, and then there is a question about what is open science. We have many different definitions and, and that's also okay. In a way, so there's there's actually now we also have one definition for open science, um, thanks to the efforts of the team and the contributors to the UNESCO open science recommendations and toolkits. But um, personally, I view open science as a concept promoting transparency, reproducibility, equity, and fairness in a, a knowledge acquisition within academia and dissemination for ecologically sustainably livelihood because we need to save this planet and ourselves on it. Um, there's some urgency going around of a global society in accordance with good scientific practice by utilizing digital tools and services, which also Louise has spoken towards. So if you haven't done so, please go to the UNESCO Open Science website, familiarize yourself with um, their materials, they where well, they're all based on um, the values and principles that we are all so fond of and have also um, embraced and wholeheartedly um defend and advocate for um and this has been a consultative process over several years and yeah uh, and there is a toolkit available which helps also various stakeholders of scholarly of the scholarly ecosystem to to implement open science on a global range okay so now to the dust study that louise mentioned to you that we've been um, um that we've put together so digital open science tools, and then the funny acronym we came up with was just um, with this based on the work that was done by Bianca Kramer and Jerome Bosman, um, where they looked into which digital tools are researchers using anyways since 2016, or the, the survey was, was done in, or published in 2016. Um, and they um, mapped that across the research workflow steps, discovery, analysis, writing, publishing, outreach, and that's the last one. Uh, assessment. And now what we did is to add a layer to ask what are the underlying values to produce or to come up with these tools, what are their financial models, what are language choices, because as we stated earlier, language is a barrier. Uh, English is not the only language spoken on the planet, and there is a lot of information in the translation into English, and there's huge hurdles for especially or early career or any researcher to navigate their already complex um, work subjects and objects in in the foreign language for some it's easier for some it's more challenging and that then limits also the, the dissemination and the exchange and the depth of conversations that can happen um, geographical location and user communities which Louise also um, already spoke to you find this in the nodo also in f1000 as a version of record um, and this basically what it looks like is a shorter version of the data set that's underlying and the results now show that, as was also mentioned, GitHub is um, uh, basically omnipresent for most tools. The underlying software is based in the United States, so you already heard how this is now limiting for some researchers in some parts of the world. The Center for Open Science stretches across several, um, stretches their serv services across several systems. Uh, workflow steps. We have digital science, as well as media, our research, science open, and PKP. Um, so these are providers. Um, then um, we are asked where and how many of these tools are they being developed and hosted. Most are US based, and then we have UK and EU, and then some are being developed and hosted in other parts of the world. Um, and then also the um, the essence is now in the terms of services, as was already pointed out by Louise. Um, some of these tools cannot legally be used by certain people in some countries because they've been sanctioned or whatever political reasons. We know that um, Russian researchers are basically not participating for the obvious reasons. Same with Ukrainians for the same but other reasons. Um, and there's other places in the world which also undergo um, conflict and um and therefore cannot engage 
So, and these are usually um, placed under the uh, umbrella of researchers at risk. So how can we be inclusive of those and make sure that their knowledge is not being destroyed in the process? Okay, um, so the, we are only scratching the surface here. I would like to quickly mention um, Africa Archive, which I've been working on for the past five years and submitting myself for the next five years. We're, this month, we're celebrating five years anniversary. And um, so one way to, uh, to ensure basically the next, yeah, so this, we've, we set up 10 principles for open, open science or open access um, communication. And what we want to make sure with Africa Archive is that academic research and knowledge from and about Africa should be freely available to all who wish to access, use, or reuse it, but at the same time protected from misappropriation, which continues to happen. <laughs> so, um, and how can we achieve that? Um, so we work with um, systems that are, okay, um, the, basically the key uh, is persistent identifiers. Um, ORCID IDs, ROAR, and DOIs, which prevent misappropriation to the maximum possible extent that we currently have access to, because it ensures um, the scholarly record to be um, engraved in the internet by, with the name of the author. It ensures, um, what's the word now, um, to, for, for the authors to be able to express priority of discovery. Um, it's removes the barrier, like if, if researchers from the global south, like a better word, um, share their preprints, it removes the barrier of geo, um, the bias against geographical regions, which is also um, uh, present. Um, yeah, and then as, uh, so, but, and then through the raw identifier now, the registry of, of um, research organizations registry, it's possible to map, and this is an ongoing process, but to map the research output by institution in such countries. And the lens um, as an indexing service does it beautifully. Um, and this has been for the past five years, actually a challenge because Africa Archive exists because there, there's still a narrative going around there's only so much African contribution to the global knowledge base. And it's not true. It's just it's not discoverable, it's not being indexed, it's not digitized, it doesn't have POIs in many of the cases. So we're back to the challenges, language barriers, um, uh, like little integration of African scholars in so so to say international or global um, consortia, low, vis low visibility of the actual output that's being produced regionally and restricted access to funding. Um, okay, where am I with the time? Sorry, I'm totally just want to have a sure. check in. Yeah, you have about maybe another three three minutes or so. Oh, okay. Okay. So, one of our projects that we work on is to translate English articles that are first also by African um, researchers into traditional African languages, and that thereby we hope to well. Basically, also for the first time that some of these languages are being digitally, um, or some of the scientific terms are being coined or, or developed for across disciplines. Um, so building was a glossary with, with all these organizations that you see here. Uh, okay, I think um, this is just to give you a landscape of, of the open science actors on the continent, it's just a snapshot, there's many more. Um, so organizations, individuals, each of us can engage with, and, and Louise and I very much do that, and especially in the African context. Um, for open access in Africa, we have various access actors. There is, um, for the African region and also other world regions, there's guidelines and organizations that should and must be consulted if you engage in, in indigenous and um, knowledge systems. Um, what we do for the discoverability of um, the research output from the various countries, we've joined forces or we've, we've, we, we're in constant collaboration, um, con conversations with the LENS and also Cookie, um, the Cookie Initiative, which helps us to now um, visualize what's the actual output um, 
additionally to a mapping of institutional repositories that we've done, which are not being indexed in the, in the Google Scholars and the, and the Web of Sciences and those things. Um, but we have now manually mapped those, well, or initiated. There's also a few more that will be added over time. And then the lens um, now through the DOI ingestion can reflect what's coming out of Africa, what's coming out of each institution in Africa and anywhere else in the world, by the way. Um, whereby Koki initiative measures the open access adoption over time, and that allows us to monitor what's happening. I'm currently in Malawi because we are setting up now the second stage of Africa Archive and deploying local open source systems for archiving of scholarly materials, text and data, and all sorts of other stuff that you find in repositories. So for the first time in Africa, we will have now there are repositories, as you've seen, but we now scale this together with the Winternet Alliance and in collaboration with the PRD organizations um, to the extent that African scholars and researchers who work on African topics with African researchers um, together now have a place to put their data and we can make sure that it's discoverable and accessible and can be um, leveraged for reuse and collaboration. For those who were not there in the demo yesterday, um, we've also initiated a mapping of open science resources. And it's a virtual map with an underlying data set, which um, yeah, I think you can also access. I don't know how, how we can share this, but um, you can find it on my website. Um, and the map can be searched by world region and language um, and discipline, open science principles, stakeholders is providing the resource and so on and so forth. And now here is similar to the map that you've seen earlier. If you look at the open science resources that are accessible by world regions, the bigger one is, but well, the two big ones are Europe and the United States. So most of the open science organizations or organizations who drive the open science narrative are based in Europe and the US. And then there's also various actors in other parts of the world. And then if you look at the map by language, again, you have a huge, um, bubble for English, but many of these resources are also in the process of being translated into other languages, which then make the concept of open science and science to society as UNESCO um, advocates for accessible on in other parts of the world, on most parts of the world, actually. Um, and, and that then helps science literacy and hopefully allows us to um, mitigate climate change more effectively as we've done so far. Yeah, um, I want to leave you and, and guide into the discussion, perhaps um, with a few um, recommendations and then um, um, questions that arise. If you are on an, um, uh, working on a project or in a research group, um, and whatever research con uh, project you design, ensure local relevance and community buy-in. And that's hard work, but it's work worthwhile and necessary, not only ethically, but it's also rewarding on so many levels. Um, inclusive project design and planning, meaning inclusive of any stakeholder on the local level, the stake, the, the collaborators, the researchers in, in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and also other stakeholders that have a stake in the project, like beneficiaries of the research output and so forth. This should be included in the project planning and design phase, which of course is a no-brainer, but often in reality, there's no time for that. But um, make sure and, and discuss with the funders to make time for that because it's crucial. Um, keep the project plan flexible because there's a whole lot of issues outside the comfortable industrial um, research context with connectivity issues, transportation, access to materials, uh, equipment that's hardly or, or that's, that's hardly dysfunctional, etc. So you need to be agile <laughs> to some extent. And yeah. I think that's that's enough for now because uh, also my voices need yeah just need a break and I would like to, uh, to to hand over to open the discussion. Great, thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, really fantastic uh, presentation, but <laughs> for me also very interesting 
because you are the only speaker that we have from Africa, from another continent. So I have a quick, quick. But African. <laughs> That's true, but you're there. You're, you're, you're there right now in Malawi. Um, a real quick reminder to our audience, if you want to ask Joe directly some questions, we have here the QR code. We can get that through Slido. But, you know, I, I just wanted to ask you, when we're talking about uh, Africa in general and Malawi, when you come to them with open science, your experience, I mean, you're the eyes and ears for us there, um, your experience with politicians and academics, are they open to open science? Are they excited about it? Or are they more skeptical towards it in general? Back from my experience, I mean, the urgency would, it's, 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 a, it's, it's difficult to answer for me. I think the, the researchers in, in Africa, across Africa, first of all, it's a huge continent, so you can't really generalize anywhere in the world, and especially not here. Um, and the incentive system is unfortunately the same as we see in Europe. So they're incentivized to publish in certain journals, maybe not as much as in high impact factor because there are serious challenges, um, not only financial, and even if they are, um, what's it called, uh, waiver fees, fee waivers, but but still these are often hard to find. And anyway, so that's, that's a bottleneck. The other one is that there's actual either racial or geographical biases against um, submissions from the Global South and certain editorial boards, which is now being worked on. So I'm not saying it's... Mm. So all these challenges of barriers are already being um, slowly but steadily removed, but um, need to constantly be addressed. So uh, to answer your question, the open science is also a topic here. And I think as much as here or there, um, I think the people who are in this conference are already sensitized to the open science, are already actors and, and advocates for open science. The question is now, how do we reach the majority of the researchers who have never heard about open science? And when they hear open science, they think of open, open access and then think, oh, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. This is also what I hear in Europe all of the time. So there's serious mis misconceptions about the concept of open science and what it can do to for researchers around the world for us as a global society to solve the, the challenges we're dealing with. And even if it's just to do research for the sake of it, which is quite rewarding and exciting, but to be able to do that without the pain points of <laughs> yeah, publishing incentives as we know them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's basically similar, if not the same, and yet you have the regional challenges on top. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, sure, thank you for that insight, absolutely. Good, and now I've heard also, uh, we have a question from our audience, I'll read it to you. In relation to your presentation, how would you rate or evaluate the activities around the global open science cloud? Um, so yeah, okay, um, I know that there's, is this also part of the UNESCO initiative? I'm not sure. So I've heard there's various open science clouds in the making. I don't know. I don't know enough about this. Um, but okay. I think as a global researcher community or scholarly community, it's good that we come together in events like this to talk, to exchange experiences, expectations, to see what's feasible, what's doable, what's, what's necessary. Um, and then what systems we create um, is another question. So there's different people, different organizations working on different levels and the global open science cloud, I don't know, have we figured out the regional ones? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I don't know. Like I, I'm yet to see what the, what the scope and the activities would be. Okay. Um, but yeah, again, like I, I'm aware that there's something in the making, but I'm not following closely. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. I know, I know these are very broad, broad uh, subjects we're dealing with, but very good. Let's continue. We have one more question coming through. I'll read that to you. Ah, can JetGPT help with some projects that you have, like, for example, translations? Do you think about integrating it somewhere? Yeah, I mean, ChatGPT or other systems, not the only one mm -hmm. that does the work that it offers. I think ChatGPT has just a whole portfolio of, of features and functionalities to offer. Um, AI is already part of our everyday life. And um, like, yes, for translations into African languages, it, they're not good enough to, yeah, to say the least. 
but we're working, for example, on the translational project that we that I briefly mentioned. We work with an organization called Masakana, and the whole idea is to build a machine translation operation mm -hmm. um, to, to yeah to feed an algorithm with the terms that we're in part coining and and the phrases across disciplines. But that's like another decade of work to go. And um, so Kiswahili is already well there are a few african languages that are covered by google scholar uh, google translate sorry um so yeah and then for editorial processes there's various aspects where where ai and machine learning can be deployed and just generally speaking um there's a lot of hype and a lot of anti-hype going around these days in the news about these tools i think as long as we keep using our brains and uh, like don't trust an automation to to make decisions for us, then we're good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Let me check with our team. Do we have time for? Yes, we do have time. I have the okay for one final question. In the EU, we often see a concentration of funding. Keyword: excellent clusters and unis. Are these local inequalities relevant? How to act against them? Question mark. And we, we, we have, have short time, so I, I, sorry to interrupt, I've just been giving the note, it has to be a short answer because we're running tight on time. Yes. We also have excellent clusters in Africa, and I think it's a matter of, like, there's pros and cons, and I'm not the one to judge, really. I think we just need to make sure that nobody is left behind, famous phrase. Um, so also in Europe, we have um, universities who struggle who are not part of these clusters, who will receive way too little funding to keep meaningful research up. Um, or we struggle and have to shut down whatever libraries and so on. So excellence clusters, I think, provide opportunities to um, for hotspots of innovation and research capacity, but it shouldn't come of the, on the expense of, of other academic ventures. Great. And with that, I say, uh, Joe Haberman, joining us from Malawi, <laughs> thank you very much. A virtual round of applause for you as well. We thank appreciate you. you taking the time. And then I will say goodbye. I have one last message I have to do. So we say goodbye to you, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, of course, Joe. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Yeah, and real quick, just uh, one or two things on our schedule. So uh, for our second day of the Open Science Conference, we've now heard from four key keynote speakers once again. And of course, the program continues this afternoon, as well as tomorrow morning, we have several practical and hands-on workshops around different open science topics. Everybody who has registered should have received an access code. You can find the workshops in the virtual conference location, and please try to be there on time. This live stream here starts again tomorrow at 11.15 a.m. And this time, Professor, Professor Tochterman, who we, ha who we saw yesterday, will be our moderator. Tomorrow, you can enjoy six highlight talks on recent research and meta-research findings related to open science and a panel discussion on reforming research assessment in the spirit of open science. Yes, and with that, I'd like to say it's been a pleasure to be with you yesterday and today. Enjoy the rest of the Open Science Conference 2023. And of course, after a short break, we look forward to seeing you at the workshops starting at 2.30. That's in about 25 minutes, and that's 2.30 CEST, Central European Summertime.